right. Start with prayer. God, we just all come before you and thank you for just the presence of your Holy Spirit. Just, Lord, that we can go to you and your word and we, look, we can look at your promises. And God, you promise us wisdom to those who ask you. Promise to give us satisfaction, Lord. So I just pray for this time and ask that you would bless it, that you just use this time fruitfully. Fill us with your spirit for those who don't know you that come to know you. Pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. The scripture for which the message is on is Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11 through 18. Again, I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong or bread to the wise or riches to the discerning or favor to the skillful. Rather, time and chance happen to all of them. For certainly no one knows his time like fish caught in a cruel net or like birds caught in a trap. So people are trapped in an evil time as it suddenly falls upon them. I have observed this also is wisdom under the sun, and it is significant to me. There was a small city with a few men in it. A great king came against it, surrounded it, and built large siege works against it. Now a poor wise man was found in the city, and he delivered the city by his wisdom. Yet no one remembered that poor man. And I said, wisdom is better than strength. But the wisdom of the poor man is despised, and his words are not heeded. The calm words of the wise are heeded more than the shouts of a ruler over fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner can destroy much good. And so the goal of the sermon series here at Midweek this fall has been that we're searching for meaning. And the point is that you can gain meaning through Christ. And meaning is meaningful if it fulfills you. It fills you with meaning. It fills you with real satisfaction and joy. But we happen to find ourselves in a culture where people find it extremely difficult to believe that Christians live a satisfied life because for many people, the Christians in our life seem to be finding satisfaction outside of their relationship with Christ. For some of us, we look at friends or we look at family or we look at grandparents or whoever it may be and they do not find satisfaction in their relationship with God. And usually, I would argue that is, is that because it's that they're not a Christian or at least they're not a, a true Christian. They're not a real Christian. They're what, they're what you would call a nominal Christian, someone who is a Christian in name only that they have this moral exterior, but they do not find satisfaction through a relationship with the Holy Spirit of the living God. And it's, it's as if I've taken the words right out of Paul's mouth in 1 Corinthians, where he says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And the main idea of the message tonight is this, that God can give you complete contentment and utter satisfaction in life through true wisdom. And so we should reje reject any other wisdom. So we'll look at what wisdom is, why we need it, and where to get it. What wisdom is. Let's first look at what wisdom is by thinking about this illustration some people, and I'm guilty of this myself at times, imagine wisdom like a puzzle. And it's like God is the one who has the puzzle box, and he can see the big picture. And when we go to God for wisdom, it's like we're asking him who has the big picture to allow us to understand the big picture better. And we ask for puzzle pieces. And that over time, over the course of our lives, seeking Jesus, he will slowly just give us puzzle pieces. But J.I. Packer says that this is not wisdom. This is not how you should think about wisdom. 
He says, quote, long quote, a deepened insight, wisdom is not this, a deepened insight into the providential meaning and purpose of events going on around us and an ability to see why God has done what he has done in a particular case and what he's going to do next. People feel that if they are really walking close to God so that he could impart wisdom to them, it would be clear to them every moment how God was making all things work together for good. Such people spend time poring over the Bible, wondering why God should allow this or that to take place, whether they should take it as a sign to stop doing one thing and start doing another, or what they should deduce from it. And if they end up baffled in the end, they put it down as their own lack of spirituality. And so Christians suffering from depression, physical, mental, or spiritual, may drive themselves almost crazy with this kind of futile inquiry. And so this is not wisdom. He's not just giving you puzzle pieces to discern why the things around you are happening. What is wisdom? Well, an Old Testament scholar says, wisdom is competency regarding life's realities. Competency regarding the realities of life. Next, how we know we need this competency. Here is the reality of life, Solomon says in verses 11 and 12. He looks out and he's written this book of wisdom to us for us to understand wisdom. And he says in order to understand wisdom earlier in this section, he says you must understand that you cannot control the outcome of your life. Nothing is guaranteed that you think that you want. In fact, the only thing that is guaranteed is death. And so take joy in your family, in your wife. Take joy in the work that you do under the sun. But if you want to be wise, you need to understand this. You need to understand and notice what I've noticed. You need to be able to to take this observation of King Solomon and, and understand it. Understand that this will be the case for you. Verse 11. Again I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong or the bread to the wise or the riches to the discerning or favor to the skillful. Rather, time and chance happen to all of them. For certainly no one knows his time like a fish caught in a cruel net or like birds caught in a trap. So people are trapped in an evil time as it suddenly falls on them. The teacher wants us to know that misfortune will strike. And to be competent, to be wise is to be competent in regard to that circumstance. That you will feel disappointment because the unexpected has happened. And the expectations that you had for your situation have not become your reality. Wisdom is to be competent in regard to all of life's circumstances, not just some of them. It's another way of saying competence is this, that you have learned through wisdom to find complete contentment and utter satisfaction in all of your circumstances. Is that you? If if, If not, then you're incompetent, and we all are. We all are. And I made a list of a few situations just to prove our incompetence, that we are in and of ourselves fools and in need of God's wisdom. You're not excelling in your athletics or your academics like you'd planned. You're single. Your campus group isn't what you thought it would be. Your body isn't what you want it to be. I'm balding. I'm kidding, I'm not. Your family situation isn't what you want. Your health Your friends or your family's health isn't what you want. Your co-leaders in your campus group aren't what you want. Your professors aren't what you want. Your school isn't what you want. You're not as fruitful as you want for the Lord. You're not as capable as you wish you could be. You don't get the attention or the recognition you want. And the only recognition you seem to get is the negative recognition. Your friends don't seem like they're there for you to the degree that you want. Your peers don't follow your convictions about everything, and because you're right, they should. So here's just a very short list of a few situations that should prove that you are not satisfied 
and that you are not content and therefore incompetent and in need of wisdom. Competence. And let's get down into what I really mean by competency. Competency is responding with the disposition that God is wise and can be completely trusted. You know that you are not responding with true competence or true wisdom when you respond to your life circumstance with anything other than complete contentedness and utter satisfaction. Produced by that deep disposition that God is wise. So God is wise for what he has given you. God is wise for the situation he has for you. That no matter what happens to you or what doesn't happen for you, you can say God is wise and therefore worthy to be completely trusted. So the question is, are you content in your situation? And are you utterly satisfied? Are you filled with joy? Philippians 4, 11 through 13, 13. I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I find myself. This is the Apostle Paul now in the New Testament saying this in verse 12. I know how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me and through him. Through what he can give you, through what you gain in him, which is him. And he is wise. God is wise. And so where do we get it? As I said, through Christ. You get wisdom through Christ. Every worldview, everyone offers you a way to relate to life's realities if you want happiness. They all try to get you in tune with the deepest levels of your being, and therefore, they promise you happiness, true freedom. But they're all lies, all of them. And they get exposed when you start to talk about misfortune and difficulty in death. Think about this. Think about the incompetency of atheism. When misfortune strikes an atheist, they can only tremble because of the reminder that they're going to die and their life is almost over. Or think about the Eastern religions like Buddhism, who would say that when misfortune strikes, you should just harden your heart and purge the desire for happiness. You should lower your expectations for satisfaction down to nothing, and then you'll be satisfied but this will just crush you and completely dehumanize you, dehumanize you. Happiness. Hinduism says misfortune, says, sees misfortune and says, well, you earned this for yourself in your past life, so just keep trying to be moral to appease our many gods until you reach moral perfection and therefore earn complete detachment from the physical world and all its desires for happiness. The key to happiness is to convince yourself that your innate desire for satisfaction does not actually exist. Happiness. Or worse yet, for name only, no Holy Spirit Christians, nominal Christians, not real Christians. I once was one. When misfortune strikes, they deep down respond in a variety of those other ways from those other religions and in their response, they're more deeply confused than probably any of the rest of them. They try to detach, and then they try to double down on their attachment, and then their unmet desires crush their hopes. They feel dehumanized, and then they start to convince themselves that it's not a big deal. They start to drift from the faith, and then they feel bad for it, and so they try to go back, and they end up putting a happy front on, trying to convince everyone that they're happy when deep down they're just as utterly depressed as the rest of them. Every other wisdom will fall flat and completely crush your deepest and most natural desires. They can only be met 
through Christ. You don't need false competencies of false religion, and you don't need fake competencies of fake religion. You need true wisdom, true competencies from the one true religion, Jesus Christ. And then Solomon goes on to share an observation of wisdom, the wisdom of God. Verse 13, I have observed that this also is wisdom under the sun and is significant to me. There was a small city with a few men in it. A great king came against it, surrounded it, and built large siege works against it. Now a poor wise man was found in the city, and he delivered the city by his wisdom. Yet no one remembered that poor man, and I said, wisdom is better than strength. But wisdom of the poor man is despised, and his words are not heeded. The calm words of the wise are heeded more than the shouts of a ruler over fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner can destroy much good. And what I want you to notice is that just as King Solomon can see wisdom through the young, poor man's ability to save his people from death, so we can see God's wisdom through Christ's ability to save all of us from death. Let me explain. True competency to live a fulfilled life is when you have that disposition, that disposition that God is wise. This is true competency. That no matter what happens, you are truly competent because no matter what, God is still wise. And you gain this competency when you gain Christ. Because when you say, no matter what, God is wise, what you're actually saying is that I can trust him through it all. And where do you gain that trust in Christ? Where do you gain that trust in God? It's when you see Christ. It's when you really see him. And not everyone who hears about him can see him. And not everyone who looks at him can see him. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again by the Holy Spirit to even see the kingdom of God. You must see the glory of Christ. In 1 Corinthians it says that the God of this age, 2 Corinthians, I believe, the God, one of the Corinthians, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers from seeing the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we are by nature blinded and going to church doesn't give us glasses. You must actually see him by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you see Christ, and you see him truly, you know that God is good because Christ is God and he left heaven and he died on the cross for all of your sin. He voluntarily went to the cross for you because of the riches of his love for you, he died. He willingly took responsibility for your sin, your sin that you committed And as Isaiah put it, he was crushed for our iniquities. And so when we gain Christ, we gain wisdom. Because we, we see the love of God for us. And we can trust him completely no matter the circumstance. And in each circumstance, each situation where we find ourselves dissatisfied even a little bit or discontent, we can if we're wise, we can wholeheartedly and solemnly say, God is wise. And when we gain satisfaction through Christ's love, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we gain that wisdom. We gain competency over all life circumstance. Because we now know that nothing can separate us from our satisfaction. 
if our satisfaction is in anything else, misfortune can strike and take your satisfaction away. But when your satisfaction is in Christ, this is what the Bible says about that. What then are we to say about these things? Romans 8. If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. And he also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of God in Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Circumstances can't crush you and leave you utterly dissatisfied and depressed when nothing can separate you from your satisfaction which comes from the power of the Holy Spirit when you understand the immense weight and glory of God's love for you. Not even death itself. And so God is so wise over even death that he even turned death from the worst possible reality for you into the best. Paul says in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because you'll be with the one who loves you. And Christ offers you this competency in all of life over all of life's circumstance. He offers you this competency in regard to any and all of life's realities. And when you have this competency, your satisfactions in God, your soul will be satisfied. This is what Christianity can give you and nothing else. Not nominal Christianity. Okay. Practical application. Lower your voice. I don't mean literally. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the Proverbs say. And fearing God begins with humbling yourself. Many of us Christians spend most of our time, myself included, too proud to admit our discontentment and our dissatisfaction. We're too broken to admit that we're broken. Because we know that admitting this is admitting that we're a fool. We know we're discontent in, in some situations. And it's hard to admit because it's admitting that you're a fool, incompetent. And don't you wish you were more competent? But only when you accept the reality that you're incompetent will you be made competent. Will you be given wisdom from God and through God's Holy Spirit? So let the humiliation that you might feel about your proud soul set in. Let it set in and feel the full force of how humiliated you should feel. And let the discomfort of believing that evil truly lives in you set in. And that a refusal to admit and forsake the dissatisfaction is a fancy way of saying that we are whining 
and nagging God. Dissatisfaction is whining and nagging God. It's demanding him around like he's our servant. You're not giving me what I want. And you go all day and you're just whining all day. You're just discontent. Discontent is the fancy word. But whining like a child, being arrogant. Those are some more difficult words to accept about yourself. <laughs> that you're just whining and nagging him all the time. You're just nagging and nagging and demanding more What could make us more of a fool than this? So, accept that you're a fool. Accept that you're the fool. The problem isn't other people or the circumstance. Certainly not God. It's your evil heart. Accept it. That's how you, lo you lower your voice. You lower your voice. You humble yourself. Verse 17, Solomon gives us wise sayings. The calm words of the wise are heeded more than the shouts of a ruler over fools. He's saying, wisdom is better than foolishness, though wisdom often hides itself in calmness. And the loud person is heard by fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner can destroy much good. So lower your voice. Number two, listen to God. And I'm just gonna leave off with this Old Testament reference in Psalm 119, 97 through 104. Listen to God. How I love your instruction. It is my meditation all day long. Your command makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is always with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, because your decrees are my meditation. I understand more than the elders because I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path to follow your word. I have not turned from your judgments for you yourself have instructed me. How sweet your word is to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every false way. Listen to God by receiving his word. Spend time learning and meditating on God's word. Lower your voice so you can listen to God. Let's pray. God, we just pray for wisdom. I pray that anyone here who will not listen to your wisdom, you would convict of their need for, for Christ. And Lord, that they would just give up on their life and give up on the pride and humble themselves and give themselves to you, repenting of their life of sin and rebellion and turning to you that they'd be reconciled by the power of your spirit, Lord, and for everyone else, anyone else who does know you, that in our reconciliation we would grow in our wisdom, Lord, that we would be competent for the realities of life, Lord, the misfortunes that will strike, that you would make us ready and give us wisdom, that we would be able to deeply believe and deeply say, God, that you are wise, that we can trust you completely, and we do this because we can see your goodness at the cross. We can see your wisdom through the cross. Lord, you give us competency over even death itself. How much more do you give us competencies over anything in this life? Oh God, give us wisdom and contentedness. Satisfy us with your faithful love, we pray. Amen.